the Vietnam experience has touched all of us and has influenced veteran authors and poets. And we are blessed in chapter 109 to have two published authors of our chapter. Uh, Mark Fleming wrote At the Speed of Foot in 2012. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And most recently, uh, we really want to thank Larry Kirshner, who has just published a collection of his poems with the title Grave Lines. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested, and I'm sure our viewing audience would be interested, how did this Vietnam um, experience influence you as writers and poets? And so I'm going to bounce that question off of uh, both of you, but I also want us to have a conversation while our cameras eavesdrop on our, our talk. So how did the Vietnam experience influence you as a writer? Well, to me, in simple terms, it gave me something to write about that I can't forget. It keeps rolling around in my brain, and I keep processing it and thinking about it, and over the years, come to a different perspective. And I've written some poetry. My book about the Appalachian Trail includes it, so it's always there. I mean, it's, and even if I'm not writing about Vietnam, somehow it influences the way I think about other things. And this is your first book that you've uh, authored? First or? book of prose. I had a book of photography out earlier, but that really didn't touch any of this. And I know that that book has a number of um, references towards your experience and how that has influenced you on hiking the Appalachian Trail. Right. And I'm going to answer the, ask the same question uh, for you, Larry. How did your Vietnam experience uh, influence you as a poet? Well, the, the Vietnam experience influenced my whole life. And I've written poetry since I was a child, but um, really didn't start taking poetry seriously until I had returned from Vietnam. Um, I met some poets in Alaska and started trying to deal with uh, the feelings, the impressions, um, just the whole um, experience of Vietnam. And somehow poetry, for me, seemed like an appropriate way to deal with it. It's, it's a way of trying to encapsulate strong, intense um, scenes or emotions in a small number of words. Larry, you have a, a book called Grave Lines, and I'd be very interested how you chose the title Grave Lines. I actually went through about six or eight different titles, um, and finally, um, most of the poems in this book are fairly intense. Um, I described it as being in your face kind of poetry, and the um, for the person reading it, I want them to understand this is a grave, grave thing that we're talking about. And there's a double entendre of grave and headstones and that. Being serious as right. well as headstones. And lines, um, you know, uh, in the military, you're always got to be in line, um, lines, lines of poetry. So it was kind of a double entendre. And um, I, I ran across a, uh, something that uh, Yates wrote in a, a letter to a friend of his. He said, I am still of the opinion that only two topics can be of the least interest to a serious and studious mind, sex and the dead. Mm. And the next uh, book that I'm planning will take up the other topic. <laughs> okay. Uh, you did warn our viewing audience that this was an in-your-face um, collection of poetry, and... I didn't really catch that until I read the first one, and, and it was called Answering a Question. And the first line said, the first man I killed was small and hidden in the tall grass. Well, that caught my attention, and I realized this is a serious poem. Would you read that one to our audience? I will. Uh, this poem came out of uh, <clears throat> something that we did in this chapter oh, four or five years ago. There were a number of us wanted to do something to help with uh, counter-recruitment. So I came up with the idea of interviewing a dozen veterans and asking them the question, what 
would you like someone who's considering going into the military to know? And we did a three-minute interview with 12 people, one uh, conscientious objector and 11 veterans. And then we got some local bands to put some music in, and we put that CD out. And this poem came out of part of what I had to say to answer that question. That's where the title comes. Answering a question. The first man I killed was small and hidden in the tall grass. Being a killer forever changes you. Even if you learn to be kind and considerate and civilized, that part of you is always there, hiding down inside, awaiting a chance. A normal person does not want to kill and will avoid it at all cost. The military won't allow you to remain normal. It doesn't matter if you think that you are smart enough not to get caught up in their lies. They will change you. Mm. Don't be sucked into the biggest myth and lie that killing and dying for your country is somehow heroic. Really be all that you can be. This poem actually, I was a, uh, when I first got there, I was an armored personnel carrier driver. And the first, one of the first uh, um, battles that I was in, we were driving through some tall grass and there was a man hiding from us in the grass. And as I rolled over him, his head got caught in the track and caused the track to come off the vehicle. And the driver's job is to put the track back on the vehicle. And it's, you know, there's, I don't know, 100 shoes. Each one weighs about 25 pounds. So you have to break the, take the bolts out, lay the track out, jimmy your vehicle, bring the track back in, put tension on. And this in the, is in the midst of a firefight, the shooting at you while you're doing this. And this man's head had caught in the track. In what, so his body parts were all the way across the, Across the track, so that's that's a pretty intense memory. The smell and the sound and mm -hmm. the whole tension. So that's that's part of where that poem came from. Thank you for sharing that, um, Mark. You had a different experience than what Larry did, but it still has influenced you greatly in all of the things that you are involved in peace and social justice. And one of those things, as I understand, it led you to take a long walk. That's true. Do you want to tell us about that? Because that is the title of your book, At the Speed of Foot, which is about the only speed I move in nowadays. <laughs> and it's a speed most people don't move in, which is what gave me the idea for the title. And the long walk started, I came back from Vietnam, and I didn't have anything happen to me like what Larry did. I was in the field. Things were going on around me, but it never touched me in that way. So nothing happened, right? So, but something wasn't right. And I went, came back to Virginia and found the mountains and started walking. And of course, I'd learned to backpack in Vietnam. I could carry a heavy pack and I could hunt mountains in a long time. So I started walking and all the years I saw the Appalachian Trail. I was like, oh, it goes this way to Georgia and that way to Maine. And, wow, I could never do that. Well, long story short is, yeah, I did. I mean, I finally decided I wanted to do it. But by this time, that was 30 years later, and the Vietnam was just there. You know, it was something I'd sort of dealt with, but nothing happened, right? So I went walking, and the experience was pretty profound that it was with me. And it had always been with me on the trail, but there were always short trips. You know, walking in the woods, yeah, it's like, kind of like Vietnam, but it's over in a weekend, you're back to the job, back to normal life. Well, now it's day after day after day after day. And when you say after day after day, we're talking maybe two or three months of walking? Yeah. I mean, the whole trip was 180 days. Much This really took place in that first half as I walked into central Virginia. Uh, that's where it, this had all happened. And it really helped me come to terms with it. I mean, I can't change what I did. I mean, I went to a war I believe was wrong. I can't change that. But what I can do is take that experience and relate it to others. You know, tell people, like Larry does with his poems, that this is what happens, and this is how it changes. And the, and the ironic thing is, I just, I went to Vietnam thinking, I'm just gonna get past this, I'm gonna 
get out of my life and get on with it. And I realized you don't get past it. it that was a big... Well, in, in page 71, you said, thoughts of and about Vietnam followed me up the trail. Yes. They were there. You know, it's like I, had a, I called it my daily thought parade. Everything, you know, I would think about Maggie. I would think about friends back in Phoenix. I'd think about this. But Vietnam was always there. And there were some days... I don't know if I can find it right off, but some days just felt like uh, it was. I was back in Vietnam. The sense that I had that I'd be walking along. Yeah, I'd be walking along, and that there could be a booby trap, or I could set one. There was always something in the wood line you needed to check. Yeah, this it, is somewhere along Appalachia. This is back and your to, mind would go right back to... I was back in the world, and somehow my mind was back in, in Vietnam. I had an experience of falling in with poets, and they could express themselves in such short, direct bursts. And that's how Vietnam comes across much better. I mean, there are people that have written fantastic novels, uh, nonfiction pieces, and all of which add to it. But if you really want that, tenth, that sense of what, how it was and it's in, in the immediacy, Poetry really works. This, th what you just said reminded me of this poem. It says, driving, I remember to note sights which would be good for an ambush. Walking, I watched the ground for dirt which may have been recently disturbed in the laying of mines. Over 40 years later, I still expect the bullet to hit that spot just below my left scapula that always itches like a target. Over 40 years later, I remember when we were boy warriors thrown together far from home. Gun smoke, thick as fog, hot brass litter, the lamb-like smell of napalm, burnt indigenous personnel, piles of bodies, slowly moving limbs in rigor, green thick Vietnamese jungle vines, sticky red clay, mud, and monsoon season. If he wasn't part of that piece of me that couldn't come home, maybe I could remember my friend's face 40 years later. Mm. It's that same feeling. It's, it's always there. You can't forget. Yeah. Larry, I, I was moved when I read on page 69, Whoa there, partner. Oh. And that was an interesting one. Uh, that, why don't you read that for our audience? Yeah, I, I'm not even sure where this one came from. I, it just sort of happened one day. Whoa there, partner. Democracy doesn't mean choose your own government. An American broom of culture and rightness sweeps history clean. Didn't you know people aren't even a sandstorm in this desert landscape where our free market vision will be built? We religiously sing the new American spiritual, a simple melody of redemptive violence. The song we sang with patriotic pride at Maile, Nagasaki, and Dresden will replace your grandfather's wailing tune. Your illusions will be cured by the chemotherapy of depleted uranium, leftover cluster bombs, and Yankee enthusiasm. You will sleep at midnight. I will steer the boat down the Euphrates. It's, it's you know, it's the, the American sureness that we know, we're so exceptional that we know what's best for all of these people, especially the brown and the black people, that, um, that whatever it is that we think should happen, it's obviously meant by God, and that's the way it should be. Mm. So, uh, yeah, when I, when I was uh, in uh, Iraq, um, this was between the two wars, um, and seeing all of the kids there that were had diseases as a result of the, the um, depleted uranium. I talked to one um, pediatrician who, we were there in August, um, and between January and August, she had seen so many um, kids, it was like 60 kids with fetal, major fetal anomalies um, that you know a normal pediatrician would see wouldn't even see that many in a whole career, and and yet we're we're doing nothing um, about uh, about the the whole 
you know, depleted uranium. We, we left over 3,000 tons of depleted uranium in, Vietnam, in uh, Iraq, and that has a half-life in, in the billions of years. Um, I wrote this one poem. Um, it, we, we stopped at a hospital one day and met this 14-year-old boy named Kamal. He was nothing but skin and bones. And um, we, you know, we just visited him there in the hospital. And I breathe in Kamal three days from death in a Baghdad hospital. I breathe out the happy, laughing 14-year-old boy. I breathe in the grasping Imperium. I breathe out America as she should be. I breathe in my life. I breathe out. Um, it's, you know, the, the destruction to the children of the world that we're causing is, is the thing that moves me most. You know, we, we killed 500,000 children under the age of five through the 13 years of sanctions against Iraq. And Dick Cheney had the gall to expect that our troops would go in there and they would greet us with candy and flowers after having killed a half a million of their children. It's, it's you know, it, to me it seems like American foreign policy is we will kill your children until you do what we say. Until and you that's, like us. Or even you like us, yeah. That, well, keep in mind, Dick Cheney didn't have the experience you and I had about going to war. Yeah. He still sees it as exactly. one of those great, exactly. great yeah. ideas. John Wayne movies, mm -hmm. yeah. Larry and, and Mark, one of the things I do with veterans uh, is emotional freedom techniques. And you've shared, both of you, some very hard things. I want us to pause right now that you can join me and our viewing audience. So if you want to put your book down, um, one of the things that we can do is to help us to de-stress and to deal with some of these memories and unwanted memories is to do the following. So I want you just to join me and tap on the meridian point. And this would be just a, a quiet one. We don't need to say words, but uh, our minds are filled, our subconscious is filled with some of the thoughts, the poems, the images, and we have, and it's good that we just take that time to de-stress. And if you want to tap on the other meridian points, there's a point on the eyebrow just on both sides. We can tap on that. And on the side of the eye. And underneath the eye. the nose, underneath the nose here, and under the chin here, and this will make a sound that our mics will hear, but it's just on the chest here, and then under the arm, and on the top of the head, and I want each of us to take a deep breath. Let it out slowly. Many times when we're dealing with veterans who have the type of experiences that each of you have experienced, we have a subconscious memory of that event. And I know you have as a, a poet, and you have very carefully brought out words that uh, I was reading with my eyes, but I was tapping with my hand, Larry, just so that you would know, you know. And as you were sharing poems, I was mentally tapping because I know that those are, are stressors, but it, it gets the truth out. And, and we, as Veterans for Peace, want to have a show that deals with the cost of war. We also want to see a healing brought to victims of war, both those that were part of the occupied countries that we were part of, and also ourselves and others. And so um, uh, I'm glad that we have that opportunity uh, to share with our viewing audience.